Hi, welcome everyone. Can you hear me? Good. We'll just let a few more people um, join us and then we'll get started. Give it a few more minutes. Hey folks. Hi, everyone. Um, I'm Melissa Aronchik. I'm going to be moderating today's event. Just as we get started, love to hear where you are all zooming in from. Um, I'm here in New York City. Um, love to know if people are coming in from near and far. If you want to put the name of where you're currently located in the Zoom chat. That's always kind of fun. Nice. We have some good, some good Jersey rep, <laughs> good Jersey representation, and some good international representation as well. Brussels, Netherlands. Where did I see Chile? Fantastic. Very exciting. Spain. Nice. Okay. This is looking good. We have a very long RSVP list. So we're gonna just give it another couple of minutes um, to make sure everyone's joined us before we get started. If you're just joining us, we're doing a kind of a roll call, so to speak, uh, just to asking where you're zooming in from. So we get a sense of, uh, of community here on the screen, um, seeing far and wide and uh, nearby, as in New Brunswick, New Jersey. <laughs> that's also good. Or New Brunswick in Canada, that's also good. Welcome, everyone. Just a couple more minutes.
Yeah, we can go in about two minutes, Melissa. And uh, I think Jessa was just having a little bit of tech trouble and was going to re-log in, so. No problem. Okay, I'll wait, obviously wait for you to come back. We won't start without you. <laughs> okay, so as Jeff's just sorting out his technical stuff, uh, welcome everyone. Um, really great to see you all here. Uh, we had a really long RSVP list, so we're just giving people another minute or so to log in. Um, great to see all the people I already know, um, Duke members, new and returning, great to have you here. And of course, uh, really happy to see um, the authors and editors of this special issue on digital ethnography in the journal Qualitative Sociology. Also really, really excited uh, to have this conversation with you all today. And uh, welcome all of our guests, all the participants here, uh, members of our community. Um, it's really, really great to have um, a good starting launch for our fall programming. So really great to see you. I'm gonna put a couple of stuff in the chat uh, for everyone while we're getting started. Let me just get some links linked up here. So first and foremost, the conversation we're having today is about a brand new, just out, um, special issue of qualitative sociology on digital ethnography. So the link I just put in the chat is a link to the special issue, to the articles in that special issue. If you haven't already had a chance to see it, that's the link there. I'm also gonna put in the chat a link to our mailing list for the digital ethnography working group. If you aren't already on our mailing list, um, you can go to that link, rutgersdigitalethnography.org slash contact, type us, <laughs> and you can sign up for our mailing list there if you're not already on it. That is one of the two best ways to get information about our upcoming events is to be on our mailing list. I'm also going to drop our Twitter handle in the chat, uh, which I strongly recommend that you follow. We, we are very up to date about promoting our events uh, on that site, but also links to members work in progress or work as it's being published, um, networks of other digital ethnography groups around the world that we've been starting to build connections to, um, and just, you know, ideas, tips, you know, recirculating re stuff of interest to anyone um, at any level of engagement with digital ethnography. So following us on Twitter is also a great way to go. Um, Jeff, is, is Jessa back? I don't see Jessa, I know you're here somewhere. I should actually, what I'll probably do in a moment is pin you all to the top so I can see all the people speaking, but for now. It looks like, yeah, Jess is, Jess is back on and she just uh, wrote me to say she's having a, a, a camera issue today oh, for okay. whatever, whatever reason. So no camera, but she's here. No camera. Okay, it happens, it happens to all of us because we're all very familiar by now. Okay. So maybe in the interest of um, respecting everyone's time, we'll go ahead and get started. Jeff, is that all right with you? Okay, fantastic. So once again, welcome everyone. We're so glad to see you all here. Um, my name is Melissa Aronchik. I co-chair along with Jeffrey Lane, the Rutgers Digital Ethnography Working Group. Uh, this is a group dedicated to supporting ethnographic research in the digital age and to building fellowship, providing workshops, training, uh, writing groups, really making sure we have the resources that we need to do ethnographic fieldwork in online and offline worlds. Our group includes faculty, postdocs, and doctoral students at the School of Communication and Information here at Rutgers, uh, but also across uh, the Rutgers campus, other Rutgers units, and also at other universities in the United States and internationally. So again, we have lots of members on the call now. Great to see you all here. And of course, um, welcome to everyone um, else who's just here, whether you're here for the first time, just trying to figure out what it is we do or whether this is you know, your ninth public event with us, we're really happy to see you here. Um, and of course, I want to extend a real welcome and um, gratitude to the authors and editors of the journal Qualitative Sociology um, for this special issue on digital ethnography. Um, it's gonna be a really great conversation today. So I'm really happy to, to see you all here. 
Um, let me just give a quick before, I, you know, just so I don't go on and on. I'm just going to give a quick sense of um, what's going to happen today. So um, today we have um, many of the authors and editors for today's special issue here among us. The special issue consists of seven empirical articles that use digital ethnographic methods to answer core sociological questions related to a variety of themes, including community and culture, urban life, violence, activism, professional identity, health, and social sociality. Um, what we're gonna do today, I'm just getting my notes here, is uh, we're not gonna review each piece. What we're gonna do is, um, Introduce, I will introduce the names of the authors and papers and I'll post the paper title and author in the chat. And when I do that, the author themselves is gonna post their bio in the chat so that if you wanna know a little bit more about them, you can click on the link to their bio. Um, then uh, Jeff and Jessa Lingle, who's um, also here, they are the editors of this special issue. They will give a little bit of a background on this special issue and how it came together and what it's for. And then what we'll do is get into a kind of moderated question session. Um, so the authors and editors of the special issue have come up with some questions that they can speak to. So they'll be responding to one another and we'll mostly be in the background. And then um, of course, with you know, hopefully a nice long period of time at the end, we'll open it up to a Q&A from the audience. So if that sounds okay with everyone, uh, shall we go ahead and begin? Okay. So once again, gathering my links here. Um, the first thing I'm going to do is paste the authors of the introduction to this special issue. Like I said, this is Jeffrey Lane and Jessa Lingle, the uh, editors of this special issue. And um, their, the title of their intro, introductory article is Digital Ethnography for Sociology, Craft, Rigor, and Creativity. The next article in this special issue is by Amy Oh, I'm sorry, and I just copied the wrong thing. Amy Ross Arguedas, whose article is titled Diagnosis is Subculture, Subversions of Health and Medical Knowledges in the Orthorexia Recovery Community on Instagram. So um, Amy, if you're here, please just go ahead and drop your bio into the chat for us. Sorry, I got your name a little bit cut off there. I think Amy's going ahead to do that. So let, you know what, let me paste your thing again so I get your full names. <laughs> I just blocked off the... There you go. Amy A. Ross Arguedas. Okay, thank you. Okay, our, the next article in our special issue is by Tyler Baldor. Oh, there's Amy's uh, bio. Okay, great. So Tyler's article is called Do I Know You? Managing Offline Interaction in Acquainted Stranger Relationships. So Tyler, please, when you, whenever you um, have a chance, go ahead and drop your bio into the chat for our audience members. Oh, great. There it is. Thank you. The next article we have here is by Nicholas Bascunian Wiley, Micaela de Soucy, and Gary Allen Fine Convivial Quarantines, Cultivating Co Presence at a Distance. So great, Nick is here. Um, just one second. Sorry. Next up. Uh, in the articles, we have Jabari M. Evans, whose article is titled Exploring Social Media Contexts for Cultivating Connected Learning with Black Youth in Urban Communities, the case of Dreamer Studio. Um, Jabari is going to be joining us a little bit later in this call, so he's, uh, he's not here just yet, but he will be. After that, we have Elisabetta or Betty Ferrari, whose article is titled Latency in Crisis, Mutual Aid Activism in the COVID-19 Pandemic. After that, we have Fernanda Rosa's article on code ethnography and the materiality of power in internet governance. That is followed by um, Jeff Lane and Forrest Stewart's article how social media use mitigates urban violence, communication visibility, and third-party intervention processes in digital urban contexts. Thanks, Jeff, for your bio. And finally, we have a night, we have an afterword by Mario Small. 
on uh, ethnography updated, very appropriate for <laughs> our conversation today. Um, so without further ado, I think I wanna hand the reins over to Jeff and Jessa to um, tell us about the special issue and uh, then we'll get into the questions. All right, well, such a pleasure to, to see folks here. And that was a cool little intro round, um, a bit of a speed dating round, but nice to, to lay it all out and give you all a sense of the issue. So thank you for doing that, Melissa. Thank you for covering the authors and the topics so well. Um, I'll give you a little bit of background and then um, I'll kick it over to Jessa and see if there's anything um, she'd like to add or anything I missed. Um, I wanna start by just telling you how it kind of came together and, um, and just giving a, a, a thank you to the editors of Qualitative Sociology, um, Claudio uh, Benzikri, who's on here. Hello, Claudio, and uh, Andrew Diener. And um, basically, we got an invitation to do a special issue on digital ethnography and one that would be based on um, empirical papers rather than methods reflections, which I found uh, quite appealing too, because it would be a chance to have some, some new knowledge and some new sorts of substance um, and not just sort of um, reflect on, on method. And the idea would be that these papers would address sociological questions and would be a way to teach qualitative sociologists about digital ethnography, how it's done and why it's important. And I think Jessa and I, uh, took these prompts very seriously. And these aims um, certainly carried through the compilation of the projects and through peer review and through publication. Um, but we were also given a lot of freedom, which was really neat. Um, we were given a lot of freedom as guest editors to also um, take, take stock of digital ethnography that was being done outside of sociology. And that was something we were excited about because it has a longer history outside of sociology. And we felt there was a lot of creativity and excellence. Um, and so we wanted to bring together authors who encompassed a number of fields, not just sociology, but also communication and media and information and internet studies um, and studies that we felt were very much sociological, um, but they were also sensitive to digital issues and other issues that might not be first uh, on the minds of sociologists. So it's a really interdisciplinary um, issue that that bridges fields and literatures and strategies. And it also became um, an invitation, I think, to sociology to be more inclusive and expansive um, in ethnography as well. And then a, a question that, you know, Jessa brought up early on in the development of the issue is just a very general question of like, do we have the kind of ethnography we need today? You know, like regardless of the research question or our discipline, do we have what we need to do ethnography at this moment? And I think that concern with, you know, contemporary ethnography also really animated this, this issue. So we wanted to, you know, convene authors that we thought were doing some of the most exciting and innovative ethnography right now. And we were just like totally thrilled to, to showcase that work. And um, and then I guess another piece of this was all of this is coming together during the pandemic. And so, you know, we have examples of ethnography during the pandemic. We have examples of ethnography of the pandemic um, where, you know, the pandemic is the subject matter. And then we also have work that was done um, before the pandemic as well. And, you know, one of the ways that we ended up sort of sorting out the, the pieces in the introduction was, was talking about um, some studies that we felt were maybe more reactive to the digital within the projects and others that were probably more pre proactive to the digital as well. So, you know, in some cases, something emerged in the face-to-face -face field work or in the neighborhood field work that required going online and that required new attention to the digital. And that might be an example of a more sort of reactive one. And then we have papers that are um, really focused on the digital and even the basic infrastructure of how digital life plays out as well that were um, more proactive in that. And then we have kind of everything in between. So we ended up with a variety of digital ethnographic designs and models um, on a, a whole range of topics and topics that I think are central to sociologists, but also to scholars in, in, in other fields as well. And um, um, so we've just hit a number of kind of, we've tried to hit a number of, of of questions of, of community and culture and urban life and activism and health, et cetera. Um, and then 
we were really pleased when Mario Small uh, took up our invite and, and said yes to, to writing an afterword, um, because I think Mario Small's work has been just really shaping uh, qualitative research, all research, uh, and, and um, to sort of see his engagement and to see him take you know, us seriously and take digital ethnography seriously was, was really great and probably validating and legitimating within sociology and, and probably in social science as well. Um, and so that was really kind of a nice way to, to tie up to tie up the issue. Um, so it also came together in a really nice collaborative way too, I'll just say uh, as I wrap up here, like the authors besides doing really excellent research were a lot of fun to work with. And we had a very successful kind of workshop, which we where we basically um, took the peer reviews that that came back and um, talked about them as a group and spent some time kind of game planning the revisions, um, and that that was really I think productive as well. Um, and I'll just add one kind of last note is we were we were pretty open ended about what digital ethnography means and. I think earlier in some of my writing, I know I've, I've done more sort of gatekeeping or have had a sort of harder stance or push. And in this in this case, I thought it was really um, generative to be more open ended about digital ethnography. And um, and this gave the authors the chance, I think, to define that term for their purposes. And I think that afforded a lot of variety and imagination and rigor in the, the styles of research here. And it also allowed, I think, for a lot of learning learning for, for, for Jessa and for me as the guest editors, um, possibly for the authors as they took the time to sort of reflect on what is my method here, what is the digital, what is digital ethnography, and then hopefully for, for all of you as, as readers and as interested parties. So um, a little bit of context, a little bit of background on the issue. Uh, Jessa, is there anything you'd like to, to add? She, she might be having some connectivity issues, uh, Jeff. I don't see her just here. Um, I see Jess on here, but okay. maybe, well, we can circle back maybe. Okay. Um, so Jeff, which, shall I go ahead and, and start in with some of the questions we have planned? Is that, is that good for you? Um, oh, you know what, Jess is actually trying to go on, but we're not yet. Yeah, we can't we can't hear you, Jessa, <laughs> which is all too classic. Well, why don't we circle back perhaps to Jessa and um, yeah, Melissa, if you want to run through the, the questions with the authors. Sense of what we're going to do, I'm going to I have some questions for the authors uh, of this special issue, of the articles in this special issue. And uh, I wanna hear from a few of the different authors, get a range of perspectives on um, what Jeff and Jessica have identified as some kind of motivating questions for why this special issue came to exist. So the first question has to do with um, in-person versus digital field work. So digital ethnography is of course much more than a pandemic. Uh, invention. It's, you know, there's much more to say about it than what happened during the pandemic. But that said, since the pandemic is now our lived reality, I feel like something has maybe changed um, in terms of legitimizing new kinds of digital methods in qualitative research. So the first question is, when is in-person fieldwork still vital for studying digital phenomena? Um, Betty, uh, can I start with you? Sure. Um, hi, everyone. Um, um, it's great to be here and see <laughs> so many people and also see the authors and the editors um, and, of course, Melissa again. Um, so this is a question that I've been thinking a lot about because my research in general is about the relationship between activists and digital technologies. Um, and for the article that ended up in this um, special issue, I look at mutual aid activists um, in Philadelphia that um, organized for mutual aid during the pandemic. So my project is very much kind of uh, taking shape because of the conditions of the pandemic and, and reflects that. Um, and um, this is a broader project that I'm doing, but it it in for this article, it looked at um, Instagram. And I'm saying all this, not as a way of sneaking in a mini <laughs> introduction to my piece, but just to say that, 
Um, as someone who thinks about activism, I'm always sort of trying to navigate this tension of looking at online and offline processes somewhat together. Um, and that is both sort of a methodological question in terms of, okay, what it is that that is particularly productive to look at through the lens of digital ethnography and what you know requires more in-person um, uh, work. And that is very much an open question. But what I'd like to say is also that this is very much an open question for activists as well, um, not just because of the pandemic, but certainly you know, many things have changed during the pandemic and um, activist groups that I was following from before the pandemic who were incredibly committed to doing to um, sort of offline processes, who talked to me um, in depth about how different being online was for them compared to being offline, they've changed a lot of what they're doing um, uh, in the pandemic. And so I don't have a sort of a final answer to this other than to say that this is very much in flux, not just for us as researchers, but also for the, you know, our participants, for our objects of study. Um, and so it really makes sense to kind of think about what, what research questions are driving you and also what the actors that you're interested in studying are thinking about and sort of following them as opposed to kind of deciding a priori, like how you want to do this work. Um, and, you know, this is, easier said, I guess, than done, but I think it's a good, it's a good instinct to, to sort of go back to, to try to follow what, what your participants are doing and what makes sense to them. Thanks. Um, uh, Amy, uh, what do you think about, about that? And how would you treat that question of when we have to do in-person field work versus when we do digital ethnography? Sure. Uh, thank you so much for the invitation. First of all, it's really, it's really great to be here today. Um, and I think that my, my response somewhat echoes what Betty just said. I think that for me, it really comes down to the question of, you know, what, what is the social phenomena that you're trying to understand? What is the research question? And I think obviously the divide between our online and our offline lives has become um, increasingly blurry. Um, and the online is never gonna be the whole story to the extent that there is a whole story. Uh, but I think that in general, to the extent that the social group or the social interactions um, that you're trying to understand through your research exist both on and offline. Um, and I think that to the extent that you're interested in, in understanding precisely the relationship between the on and the offline, you're going to need both in person and, and digital field work. Um, and, and in the case of the, the paper that I published in the special issue, um, I was focusing on, a, on an online diagnostic community that was, you know, first of all, it was geographically dispersed, um, but it didn't really exist offline um, as a group. And so it wasn't an extension of, of an offline group. Um, and in a case like this, in-person field work wasn't really, you know, feasible or, or necessary to understanding the group, which kind of came to be online. But it would be really hard to imagine, you know, work such as the work that's been done by Jeff and Jessa, um, Tyler's paper in the special issue, for example, you know, with such a strong offline component, it would be hard to imagine to really understand the, the, the kinds of social interactions that are going on without looking both on and offline. So I think it, yeah, it really does ultimately come down to the question of what is the social phenomena that you're trying to understand. Yeah, let, let me turn to Tyler, actually. Do you wanna contextualize that question of in-person versus digital fieldwork in your own article? Sure, thanks. So yeah, from my perspective, I was coming to the digital through studying in-person encounters in physical gay bars and nightclubs. And something that I found was, as I was trying to figure out what the community or the social network was in these spaces, as just an urban ethnographer, it looked like really anonymous spaces. But then I realized as I started to talk to people in a more pointed way about their digital interactions that these spaces weren't actually anonymous. They were kind of these acquainted strangers, as I call them, ignoring one another in this space, which is really different from, oh, this is an anonymous urban nightclub, right? There's a lot more under the surface here. Um, and that's how I found my way towards weaving the digital more closely into the into the in-person field work and just asking way more pointed questions about people's digital interactions and even questions like, who do you know? How do you know them? What is your relationship? I think once you start to ask those pointed questions about people's social relationships, the digital kind of organically can come out because our lives are so hybridized. Um, so I feel like for me with this question, 
like whenever the digital is in place in a physical community or subculture, which is probably most of the time, ignoring in-person dynamics will leave us with an imperfect picture, right? Just as ignoring the digital will do so too. Yeah, that's that's a very good point. Um, as all three of you have made that you just can't study one without paying attention to the other in these, in these cases, even though the cases are really quite varied. So um, there's another question now, I'm gonna direct it first to Nick. And that's to ask about one thing you found um, in your study and how your position in the field, field um, or your conceptualization of the field, how did it evolve to make that finding possible? Great, thanks again. And I'm tuning in from Chile, so if the connection's a little off, bear with me. Um, yeah, I studied eating online during the pandemic over Zoom, um, and I got to eat from home, unfortunately not sharing the same smells and tastes with other people. Um, but one thing that I did learn was that I had this assumption that everyone was sacrificing something by being online and eating together, that they were uh, losing out by not sharing across the table until one participant said, I'm going to be really sad when this is over and my friends don't want to get online with me. You know, they connect across the world, make the space to talk to me. And uh, that really shook me because it kind of brought my assumptions back to, you know, the change is not necessarily inherently a negative one. And and for some people, the new situations were were even more comfortable. She She identified as an introvert and as someone who really liked the kind of control over when she, you know, was able to get into this space and leave and she could drink as much as she want because she was at home and her friends were, um, you know, could, could didn't have to find designated drivers. And so she was kind of giving me this whole new perspective on, you know, I'm not entering a space that's necessarily a step back in terms of the culinary and the gustatory exchanges and, and commensality eating together. Um, the, the kind of the social, the beautiful social elements that come out of that, this is just a, a, a slight, slight change. And I, I think I had to kind of check my own perspective, my own assumptions uh, as I was entering that field and, and learned that I also loved elements of it too. You know, I got to kind of shut down. I didn't have to play, you know, guest or host too much. I could come into the Zoom room and talk to people and then leave you know, us, not to say that there weren't the the pitfalls of some of the, you know, connection issues, et cetera, but just that there's, you know, my own position changed a bit in, in that regard. And um, I'll post the quote for people to see uh, what she said exactly, but I'll, I'll leave it there. Yeah, great. Thanks for dropping the quote in. I, that's really relevant. And I think we can all relate to the eating online <laughs> during the pandemic phenomenon. Um, let me ask that same question then for Fernanda, um, something you found in your study and that your position in the field or conceptualization of it made it um, made it, made that finding possible. Sure. Uh, thank you so much for organizing this panel. Uh, and thank you for everyone to who are here. Um, interested in methods. Uh, it's pretty amazing. Um, I'll say that uh, what I found was exactly what I was looking to find. <laughs> uh, I was looking for inequalities between the global south and global north embedded in internet infrastructure. Uh, and what was uh, what interested me the most, and that I didn't know how to what I would find out, was how our data circulate online. So I was interested in unveil uh, that infrastructure that is behind what we call a network of networks, like how these networks come together for our data to circulate uh, in the whole, in the global uh, internet. Uh, and I was studying specifically uh, internet exchange points, which are internet nodes where networks come together to interconnect and make that flow happen. Uh, and what I found is that uh, it's much uh, more possible for data from global south to go to the global north than the opposite to happen. Uh, but for me to get there, uh, I had to, to go uh, beyond the physical infrastructure that I was looking at. And I was inspired by 
literature on ethnography of infrastructure. And that's what I was doing. I was look, I was going to the places to see the, the geography of data centers and of these internet nodes that we call XPs. Uh, and then during my interviews, uh, people were talking about the code that make this, this thing happen, that make our data to go from one point to another. And for a while, I didn't pay attention on that because I didn't have the literacy uh, to pay attention on code. On code. Uh, this code is an internet protocol. And the, the case specifically of circul data circulation, it is called border gateway protocol. Uh, but then uh, as I was looking at these dynamics and the arrangements that our internet service providers at our house make for our data to circulate, uh, that was when I, had, I said, okay, I need to look at code and I need to understand how this is playing a role in this physical. So at the end of the day, uh, the, the found about the inequalities uh, came out uh, also because I was looking at the intersection between the logical and the physical. And I think this is only possible, uh, responding to the question, uh, because our field of communication, specifically where I come from, our internet governance, that is an interdisciplinary field, is talking more and more about the materiality of uh, our communication uh, media. And I think that once you start looking at this materiality, necessarily uh, you may go deeper. And the idea of going deeper or enrolling other actors uh, like code uh, requires from us uh, listening to things that we are not used to as social scientists. Uh, we, we are used to listen to people, but what about listening to things? And then uh, I think we may start following things, not only people. And then it's not that you are not you are not giving attention to people because people are there playing a role programming this code. Uh, but what if you shift your attention and look at code and see what it may tell you? And that's uh, I think. Uh, a methodological contribution as well uh, in this in this realm. Thank you. That's uh, fascinating to think about um, border gateway protocols and how most of us are just not at all fluent in that language. Um, so let me ask that same question now to Jeff. Jeff, what are your thoughts on these kind of the findings that are revealed in your in your research? Um, yeah. So maybe I'll I'll take this in the direction of like the the theoretical evolution of the field or of the research and you know, long after the field work was done and in the writing up and in the fellowship with other ethnographers, which is like one of the reasons why it's fun to do stuff like this is you get to talk to other folks that are doing, you know, projects that overlap with yours and you get to say, hey, this is going on in my corner of the world, what's happening in your corner of the world. And sometimes you see connections and similarities and differences. And that that sort of um, happened when I when I had the chance to write this paper with um, with Forrest Stewart. And the, the theoretical kind of framing came from, you know, exporting a communication theory into urban sociology. And, um, and the finding that kind of joined my study in Harlem and my co-author Forrest Stewart's fieldwork in Chicago was that social media use was often allowing community members to de-escalate neighborhood violence. And what clicked um, later on in my sort of reading in, in the communication literature was this idea of communication visibility, which comes from organizational communication. And it's a theory that's about how social media allows professionals to see who knows what and who knows whom at the firms where they work. And it can be very, that can be very transformative for, for the firms and for the individual professionals and workers. And it's also really a theory about onlooker effects, um, about how third parties can influence situations um, at work and how workers are always kind of responding to and changing their behavior based on the fact that others are able to see their workplace interactions and see their work and see their relationships online. And we were seeing something very similar inside the neighborhoods that we were, we were studying. You know, we were basically seeing concerned 
third parties like girlfriends and wives and family members and pastors and outreach workers observing on social media the actions and the interactions and the relationships of young people who were closest to violence and were intervening with these young people and acting upon situations and relationships to preempt violence. And often they were rerouting young people from potentially violent places or people or encounters. And in many cases, they were doing so way before the immediate moments in which gun violence might happen. So the community members were looking much further upstream from the operation sort of ceasefire and some of these more kind of formal models of intervention that tend to start as soon as someone's been shot and that tend to try to prevent violence um, working from that that place. So we were seeing that um, that this was happening um, really across the network and much earlier um, than, than, than we thought. And, um, and that also young people who were in this sort of violence were also acting on the fact that others were concerned about them and were able to see what they were doing online. And they were taking step, steps to preempt and de-escalate on their own and in coordination with others. So it was about kind of moving, you know, a concept and a theory from organizational communication and from firms to neighborhood streets that I think really helped us explain our studies and figure out a way we could contribute and frame our work and link our work. Um, and then we were also trying to kind of differentiate um, uh, what was happening with these caring community members um, from other uses of communication visibility that we might associate with surveillance, with, um, with the more punitive measures of police, um, and even with like neighborhood watch groups and digital vigilantism, which are often based on kind of othering someone and like exclusionary measures, you know? And what we were seeing was actually that this was really about what was happening in Chicago and Harlem was really about integrating actually and protecting those at risk within their community, as opposed to separating or excluding them. Um, so the article kind of evolved as a kind of back and forth with communication, uh, urban sociology, and then the sort of intervention uh, literatures. So that's how the field sort of changed or expanded for in, in my case. Okay, thank you. Um, it sounds like also having co-authorship, that kind of collaboration added to or deepened that kind of insight. Um, let me move now to a question on ethics, which I think is really a common, I, I don't think we've had any public events where the question of ethics hasn't come up. Um, it's just, it's constantly changing um, environment, landscape for us to think about. So here, um, the question is about advice that some of you might have for students, but I, I would add for, for all of us really, um, who are increasingly concerned about either the ethics of in-person fieldwork or the ethics of digital fieldwork, or perhaps in the process of combining them. So Betty, can I come back to you and, and uh, hear what you think on that? Sure, um, I could go on for a while uh, musing about um, ethics because it's a topic that is dear to my heart. Um, I think uh, there are a few things that um, I usually tell my master's students when they have to think about um, uh, the ethics for their own um, sort of master's thesis and that's to some start by thinking about what's the possible thing that that the possibly worst thing that could happen um, and then kind of take it back from there. Um, and it sounds like a little bit of a pessimistic take, but it actually is very helpful um, for them to think about sort of how they situate themselves uh, with their research and you know what it is specifically that their project is trying to do. Um, and I think that's that would be useful advice. Um, and I, I come from this, I come to this from the perspective of someone who does research with activists. And so I, you know, I like I like to think about the ways in which um, research should be, you know, documenting what what and understanding what activists are doing and not harming what what they're trying to do that that would be my position so something to sort of keep in mind when working with different types um, of population is sort of trying to understand what the purpose of our research is and and trying to make sure that it doesn't go against the what you know what what our participants um want to do but just overall i think you know it's important to say that 
you don't always get it right. Like you don't always get it right all the time. And so what, what makes for, I, I think, good ethical research is to be able to listen to your participants and be reflexive about what is going on, you know, and, and adjust in case something, you know, is not working the way that you think you're going to be working. I think, you know, I know that there are many people who, um, are involved with air uh, on this call and you know the air ethical guidelines have you know guided many of us not just in terms of practical recommendations but in a way of thinking about ethics that is really about kind of asking the right questions and and going you know on and on with asking these questions about ethics and not being um satisfied with you know the immediate answers um i will say um i have for this paper, I was working with Instagram, um, and it was a new platform for me to think about. Um, it was also new for many of the activists that I was studying. Um, and it, specifically for Instagram, I found myself having to think about how to negotiate some boundaries around stories in terms of ephemeral content and what to do with that, um, you know, whether to capture it, how to capture it, whether to publish it. And so these are, I think, conversations that are ongoing um and uh, you know I can offer sort of what what I thought about but I think that's just like one one way of uh, thinking about this um the other thing that I found not just on Instagram but in in thinking of other social media platforms particularly when it comes to activists how to balance between sort of uh individual profiles and what individuals are posting and instead what group accounts um, are posting and in my research I usually come down on the side of just looking at the official sort of group accounts partially because I'm interested in the processes that are behind you know how activists come together to um, create this collective content but I think also there's you know something to be said about the ethics of, of mm, mm, focusing on sort of collective accounts that are not singling out specific activists it might not work in the same way for all topics or, or even you know for all activist groups but that's sort of how i found um like the way that i've that i've come down on on these issues um and i can say more about that but i, I want to leave space um, to the others yeah i i really relate to that point uh, betty about um individuals where i mean it could be activists but it could also be bad actors whose stories you're following and yet it just feels wrong to really target an individual when that's not really the point of the investigation that you're doing and yet you know you, you don't want to necessarily become an institutionalist to have to tell the story so you know, I can really empathize with that I'm wrestling with that question myself um let me now direct the question to Amy um Ross Arguedas do you have a perspective on that a question of ethics in either in-person or digital field work or both sure I think so I'll, I'll focus a little bit more on the digital side and this was something that I really struggled with in my project because I felt like I encountered different kinds of ethical challenges that I wasn't anticipating. And, and I think that to a degree, these concerns are, you know, they're warranted and I think that they're healthy because I think it's it's important to continue thinking through things uh, um, as the field work progresses. And I think that some of the basic guiding principles, um, they're often discussed in the context of, of research or of, of ethnography more specifically, uh, they seem simple enough, right? Like things like, you know, doing good, not doing harm, um, you know, protecting the, the autonomy, the dignity of participants, the safety of participants. But I think, I think in practice, sometimes it can be harder to anticipate how these principles translate into, you know, best research practices. And I think it's especially the case with, with digital field work where if things don't always translate in the same way and, and you're dealing with things like digital traces, for example, right, or even changing platform features that can create vulnerabilities um, on the get go that you weren't anticipating initially and so it, it is a challenging scenario. Um, a few recommendations that I that I have or that I would think that I would have given myself when I was just starting this is, you know, this might seem kind of obvious but but it wasn't to me at the time and the, the first one is you know don't expect uh, or rely on IRBs or, or ethic review boards to, to advise you, right, about best practices. Um, of course, you have to go through IRB, but 
in my experience, their standards, um, you know, they're often below what I think we should aim for as researchers, and they're often struggling to catch up with, with novel research methods and their implications, and I think that we need to go far beyond this. Um, and I think an analogous point is, you know, don't rely entirely on informed consent either, because on the one hand, it can be hard or unfeasible in certain online contexts to get informed consent from everybody that's participating in some way. But also, um, you can't always expect your research participants to be able to anticipate possible risks themselves, right? So I think that it, it forces you to be really proactive in th thinking through some of these things. Um, Second is just, you know, read all you can about ethics and online research. I mean, the, the, the AIR guidelines are, are, of course, super helpful. And I think these can help kind of foresee some of the challenges that you might not be thinking about. Um, I continue to struggle with ethical concerns, even as I was writing up my paper. And Jeff and Jessa were really helpful in suggesting that, you know, I revisit some of these things like the, the AIR guidelines. Also, you know, some, some work on feminist perspectives on, on ethical digital methods. Uh, that were really helpful in thinking through things for my paper in particular. Um, I could even copy a couple of additional links in the chat. Um, a third, I would say just talk to other people that have experience doing similar kinds of research projects. And I think getting that kind of feedback can be uh, really useful in thinking through what you're struggling with, and especially because there's often not this clear right or wrong answer. Um, and then number four, I think is just kind of this having this awareness that you need to consciously revisit the ethical aspects throughout the whole process from the very beginning through writing things and it's not something that you just take off at the beginning I thought about ethics before starting right and uh, I think sometimes new ethical challenges arise which was definitely my experience and I think sometimes it's important just to set time aside to, to think through these challenges and simply rethink the implications of what you're doing. Thank you, that's really useful. And yes, if you have a chance to drop some links into the chat, that would be, I'm sure people would really appreciate that. Um, I wanted to ask Jabari about this question too, but I think he hasn't joined us yet. So I'm gonna move to Nick and Jabari, if you are here, let me know. I just didn't, I didn't see you just now, but Nick, I'd love to hear your thoughts on uh, ethics and fieldwork, digital or uh, in person. Great, and I hope this is coming through again. Um, I just, was going to say that I think one thing I've learned is to pay attention to whose mobilities and whose sensibilities matter in terms of research. I've done global ethnography and sensory ethnography, which really center the researcher, you know, global going to other places, traveling around the world, being in the space, being there, right, the multi-sided approach and the sensory, you know, paying attention to what you smell, what you feel, what you hear. Um, and I thought of this project as almost a way to rethink that, you know, with doing online stuff, particularly in the pandemic, I was forced to listen to what other people had to say. I couldn't move to where they were. I couldn't smell what they were smelling. I couldn't taste their food. And so I had to use the tools of their language. Um, and this isn't exactly ethics, but it is a little bit of reconsidering positionality of, of you know, what it means to do research, whose voices matter. We talk a lot about, you know, what percentage of the book is quotes and what percentage is, you know, theory and what, and I think that the, what I've been finding is that digital ethnography has lent itself to this rethinking my own position in the field. And, you know, I, I wrote this with um, Gary Fine and, and Michaela DeSusi, and they were, you know, they were also getting kind of secondhand what I was reporting back to them about these, you know, these, these visits and these, these, you know, talking and eating with people online. And, I found it actually a little bit frustrating that I couldn't reach across the table and touch and, and smell and, and share meals with people. But um, I, I found it also a very good activity to think about, you know, whose whose voices is really really matter in these projects. And language is so limited in what we can share and what we can exchange and you know the words that we choose to describe things. But using language and using what people were telling me as the data and as all that I could get of that story in this moment. Um, as someone who loves to loves to go out and loves to travel and loves to eat was really a reflection on, on that kind of positionality. And so maybe the advice here would just to be, you know, as ethnography grows and becomes these new amazing, you know, branches of new methods, thinking how they speak to each other and reading one through the other, right? Because, um, you know, we we have to compile the IRB input, the our colleagues input, our own experiences, and and come up with something that we find you know uh, 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 to be satisfactory. So um, I'll leave it there. But I just think reflecting on whose whose uh, sensibilities and whose mobilities really matter in your work um, 
has been rewarding for me and also led to some pretty some pretty good insights in terms of new stories that have emerged and a lot of the nuances and what people actually say to me, try to communicate to me, um, uh, depending on those those stories rather than on my own um, kind of perceptions. And of course, you are also translating those stories for your readers then, but um, there's there's an added layer of giving the participants um, some voice and some, some kind of heft in their own stories. Um, so I'll stop there. Well, thank you so much. I'm like taking so many notes here. I'm like focusing, writing, focusing, writing. Um, okay, I um, I want to ask one more sort of formal question, and uh, that I also want to hear. By the way, if there are other authors uh, in the special issue who want to weigh in on some of these questions, please just you know s signal that to me. Somehow, I'm of course very happy to facilitate it. We have kind of a, a guidelines here, but these are just loose guidelines, so please, everyone, feel free to weigh in. Um, but this question is, I think, so going to be really um, relevant to so many of us, which is, you know, kind of how you know when your project is finished, or I'll ask it a, a different way, what feels most unfinished about your project? I think that, again, that's <laughs> a question we all struggle with. Um, let me go back to you, um, Betty, to start us off. So many things um, are always unfinished. Um, so there are, there are two pieces of this that that feel unfinished to me um and one um is that uh i am interested in um comparative research so for me this work was always going to be a slice of a larger project that i'm interested in doing about mutual aid activism um, across different countries so for this article i looked at a subsect of my um us data specifically about the city of philadelphia but i have um, sort of more data on other American mutual aid groups, and I am beginning new data collection about mutual aid activists in the UK and Italy. Um, and so that part, like some of the questions that have come up before I was doing this field work and during this field work on um, Philadelphia cases, I am bringing with me to, and, and I hope to make sense of looking at activists in other countries and that's generally my process um so in that sense um i'm 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 opening it up. i'm i'm acknowledging that there are so many questions that i'm left with about how mutual aid um is being transformed by the pandemic how uh digital technologies are supporting or hindering um uh, mutual aid activism and i'm gonna roll these over um, into this larger project. But the other part that feels really unfinished is about uh, sort of how do we actually do ethnographies of activists on Instagram? That is a question that I am still grappling with um, because of the specificities of, of Instagram as a platform, because of, um, uh, you know, we know a lot of things about uh, Instagram as a platform and how, um, for instance, influencers have been using it. We know quite a lot about that. We don't yet know that much about activists and how activists are using the platform and how to make sense of it. So that for me is kind of a work in progress, trying to figure out how do we even actually do a digital ethnography of uh, activist interactions, activist uses um, of Instagram. Um, and I, you know, it's a partial answer, the one that I have in, in this paper, but it's something that, you know, I think um, not just me, but many others are going to be dealing with um, as more and more radical activists are actually moving towards Instagram um, as a platform. And we've seen that over the past, you know, two or three years, but I think we're going to see it uh, more. So that part is unfinished, but it's also very exciting, I think. Thank you. Um, Tyler, do you want to weigh in on that question? Sure. So when I saw this question about what's unfinished, um, it kind of relates to the, the issue of ethics, I would say. So like for my work, which is really about how are queer men in these urban communities kind of dealing with like the epistemological issues of what does it mean to know someone in the digital age, et cetera. And the actual digital data is really coming from like in-person interviewing. And it's not so much me like hanging out in a digital space in part because the digital action is on these dating and hookup apps where unless I'm doing a more auto ethnographic kind of exploration of this and there's been really great work on that, right? I, it's sort of a black box at times for the researcher um, of like, how do you really get in there? <laughs> uh, 
And so that's something that I'm really thinking about, but I'm really trying to think through how to do this because as I've seen in my own work, there's this interplay between digital interaction and offline interaction, right? Like an, a conversation offline can move online, can move back offline. And I'm really interested in tracing those kinds of interactions and just trying to figure out how, how does one harness that information and in an ethical way? So that's something that I'm, I don't have a great like answer, but that's sort of the questions I'm thinking about. But believe me, just knowing that, you know, you're not alone worrying about problems <laughs> yeah. is already very reassuring. <laughs> um, Fernanda, can I ask you that, that same question about um, what feels unfinished or what ongoing in your work? Yeah, sure. And uh, your answers also illuminate uh, what I was thinking. Um, I think uh, because I started to look at something that is not really um, trendy in, in our studies right now, that is uh, how interconnection works, uh, I just feel I, I opened a black hole and I can go whatever in the direction that I want. Uh, this topic was uh, interestingly uh, uh, interesting some researchers in the beginning of the internet or even like before that when the school of large technical systems in Europe was at play. So they were starting to say, yeah, how networks come together and interconnect. But it sounds to me, uh, based on my research, that um, the system kind of stabilized and then uh, some of the inequalities that we had and the controversies we had in the, in the beginning were just like accommodated by the architecture and how it was designed and how code was designed. Um, so what I feel uh, and what I am super excited about right now is to understand what are the values that are embedded in the design of this code that is making this inequality to just stay as it is and also amplifying uh, such, a, such a scenario. And of course, when I'm studying uh, this interconnection, I, I am also looking at the invisible interconnection that is not appearing in the regular internet governance scholarship. And uh, I work also in indigenous territories, looking at how Celtal and Zapoteco sovereign people do their interconnections to the larger internet, which is a fascinating uh, work that uh, they do. And in looking at that, I'm thinking and asking what this global internet has, uh, what are the values that it has uh, in comparison to the values that I'm seeing in these other kinds of interconnection. They, st they stabilize the interconnection that we have today among these big corporations uh, is different from what I, I'm seeing there. Um, and I am trying now to uh, bring this together to understand what this internet is from the perspective of the South, right? Um, and I, yeah, and I think uh, one thing I would also mention is that as we can see throughout the, the conversation here, uh, we have like uh, lots of task knowledge and interest as researchers. We are not detached uh, from that. And um, when I started my work, my because I work with the colonial theory, I was very interested in this relation between South and North, which I, I, I'm still uh, interested. But I am also thinking about other variables that can be included in these comparisons. And this comes to the feminist scholarship and the relations between a body and mind. All this play a role in what I'm doing. So uh, I'll just mention that the things that are unfinished may be that you are also changing as a researcher, like trying to include other uh, topics and variables, and this will take us to like an unfinished war, uh, work forever. Yeah, it's it's never ending. <laughs> it really is. Just when you think it's over, something else happens, and then you have to account for it. Um, I see that Jabari has joined our group, and I just wonder if I could loop back, Jabari, um, if you're amenable, and ask you about ethics, the last question that we had, because I know that's something that you've faced um, in your research. Do you have some thoughts for us on 
uh, either you know ethics of digital fieldwork or in-person fieldwork that you can share with us? Oh yeah, first and foremost, I just wanna say thank you for even having me on this panel, but also being a part of the, the issue itself. It's, it's a phenomenal issue. And um, I've been reading through some of the other articles and I'm just, I'm happy I'm in good company. Um, I think with my work, I think there's always ethics when you're working with vulnerable populations. And so when you're talking about youth, uh, particularly youth that are um, from disadvantaged areas or, you know, not necessarily, um, you know, a disadvantage might not be the word, but I guess when you're dealing with youth who kind of have been underserved um, and you're in a position that you are as a professor trying to get your work done, there's always gonna be a power dynamic um, and so when you throw that into the digital sphere, it becomes even more so um, an equity thing where it's like, you know, things that they don't know <laughs> um, uh, as, it, as it pertains to privacy, as it pertains to where your work is going to go, as it pertains to uh, when they post something and you see it and, and maybe they didn't even mean to make it public, but it's public. Uh, or, or maybe it was public at a certain point in time, but they think that uh, you didn't get a screenshot of it or a screen grab of it. Uh, and, and the speed at which youth culture moves is, is it's light years beyond those that are in, in my cohort, right? So uh, I think there's always gonna be this, this inside voice that's, that's telling you like, are you doing this um, for the sake of the betterment of the field? Or are you doing this for the sake of the betterment of your career? Or are you thinking about the actual subjects themselves? And I think coming from a space of being a former social worker, the, the, um, the latter is always on my mind. So it's like, you know, I try not to be too far into the matrix that I'm not, a, a, I guess, approachable or attainable to, to my subjects or whatever. So it, it, it definitely, comes a point where I have to draw the line and sometimes not use things that would be great for the article or not say things that would be uh, compelling or would um, draw folks in or maybe even win awards or whatever. Um, because, you know, ultimately it, it's about telling the story, not just in an accurate way, but um, telling a story in a way that showcases the strengths as uh, of, of the, the people who I'm talking to and also protects their interests um, because they're sharing, just them giving you the access, you realize how blessed you are that they're willing to give you this much access to their lives. Um, and so even with the organizations that I've been involved with, trying to make sure that I, I you know, show a balanced viewpoint of what it is that they're doing as well, because I think, um, there's always ethics in that. So I was seeing things that the executive director wasn't seeing. <laughs> you know, I was seeing things on social media that their teaching artists weren't seeing. I was seeing things their parents might not even be seeing or hearing. I was invited to conversations. And so, yeah, there's always going to be ethics involved with that. There's always going to be in internal tensions involved with that. I think for this particular article, um, I was... I think this particular article was easier to do because uh, unlike my dissertation work that was in a classroom, these students were very much voluntary, knew exactly what you know I had done before. And they were like, oh, this is like a follow-up, okay. You know, so it felt more like we were partners in, in partnership in terms of them telling me, so you're not gonna come to this conversation that we have in on Clubhouse? Or you're not gonna do this? So it's like, it they, it felt more inviting this time around. Um, but even within that, you know, there's always the, the internal clock telling you, you know, maybe this shouldn't be included or maybe that shouldn't be included. And I think that trustworthy uh, vibe that we had was because, you know, I had been following them for, you know, two, three years at this point. And you bring up a great point, uh, Jabari, about younger people in the sense that when I work with students, my undergraduate students, you know, I'm assuming they know so much about the digital because they, they do, but sometimes they're really not aware of what you can capture, what you can see, or what types of platform features are enabling us to see or understand things that they haven't seen. So you can't just assume that they know and so that therefore it's fine for you to take it. So I appreciate your pointing that out, that it's really a collaborative 
dynamic you have to establish uh, with your your respondents. Exactly, because their purpose is different. You know, like they're trying to gain attention for a music career. <laughs> they're trying to gain attention from uh, an imagined audience, a fan base. Um, they're also trying to vet their peers to get knowledge to sort of enter into creative industry and cultural industry. And I'm sitting there thinking about how this fits into a continuation of the work that I've already done. And I'm thinking about, um, you know, other folks who are in the field. I'm thinking about conversations I've had with Forrest, conversations I've had with Jeff. I'm thinking about all of this simultaneously while I'm listening to them talk. I'm thinking about conversations I've had with Desmond Patton. I'm you know, all of that stuff is entering my mind and they're not aware of the powwows and the, the conversations at Google and all the stuff that's going on uh, in terms of, you know, how this will be framed, how this will reach a certain audience. And so I think, you know, I think having been a practitioner, not just a practitioner as a social worker, but actually having been a musician, uh, I think it helps in this instance that, you know, I'm very sensitive to their stories and their narratives. Thank you. Um, I really want to uh, make sure we have time for questions now. So I think what I'm going to do is turn to the chat and um, just call on people in the order I saw their questions in the chat. And if you're here and you want to ask the question directly, that would be great. So I, I first I saw um, Sylvia Darling's question about um, COVID and restrictions. Do you want to jump in, Sylvia, if you're here? I'm not sure if she's still here. Oh, yeah. Sylvia, do you, um, if you're still around, do you want to ask? If not, I'll, I can go ahead and ask the question. Um, which is whether the panelists, um, the authors of the special issue, have had um, experiences when they felt forced to rely on digital ethnography as a result of COVID travel restrictions. She says, I totally get that the social phenomenon should drive the method, but what happens when external forces influence which methods you can leverage? So I know Nick really kind of squarely addresses that in, in his article. Um, so I don't know if Nick, you want to weigh in on that or if others uh, have a related experience they want to share on that question. I think Nick just jumped off because he's in he's in Chile in a, a an area with not great connection. Actually, oh, okay. Um, is there anyone else who wants to weigh in on that question of when you feel sort of like you have to use the digital approach, whether or not that was what you had in mind? Okay, now, maybe if people have thoughts that as they as we move forward, you can just drop them into the chat. Um, I'm going to go to the question from Michelle. Sarah, Michelle, are you here? Do you want to ask your question? I know Yoni mentioned it, responded in the chat, but it'd be great to get a live conversation going. Yeah, hi. I'm, I'm actually thinking about the end of the process when you decide what data you're going to use in any publications. Um, and I know some scholars have suggested kind of paraphrasing text posts from social media or fabricating some way to protect the anonymity. So um, a lot of data is traceable, right? You can put something into Google, find the user probably pretty easily. And I'm wondering what you all think about, you know, paraphrasing, fabricating, kind of altering the original text so as to protect that anonymity. I can I can take a stab at it. I, I mean, I think Jessa has already kind of addressed it partly in the chat and added some other uh, interesting and helpful readings. And I think, like she points out, I mean, there's always going to be trade offs, right? Like you're the second that you paraphrase, you're kind of changing the way that the person expressed it. And, and even if you even if you try your best not to like, it's, it's just you're, you're getting a step removed from the original data, right? And but but I think that that sometimes just because of the risk of a person being like readily identifiable, it's it's sometimes a trade off worth taking. And at least in in my paper, I did this both with the text and I also with the images that I used that were a photographic intervention, so they couldn't be traced back to the original. And I also um, paraphrased um, a lot of the quotes that I that I used, at least the ones that were directly from posts. Um, and I did my best to try to be faithful to the tone, to the ways of expressing themselves, but just enough to make it not, not something that was an, as searchable, at least. And um, I understand that it, it's not ideal in some senses, but it, for me, I was prioritizing, you know, trying to protect the, the privacy of, of people who may have changed their minds about, you know, to what extent. And, and once you find one, one post, then you can kind of go back and look through, you know, the whole profile 
Um, and if people don't have, you know, privacy settings set on, in my case, I was only following public accounts or accounts that were public at the time, um, then you might expose people to having their, their content read beyond that. So I, I decided to go with that approach and, and with, with all of its imperfections, but it was kind of an issue for me of trying to, you know, prioritize that above you know, wanting the, the the data to be like in its purest form to, to say it in, in some way. I mean, there's a, the option of uh, of going back to your participants and asking them to paraphrase their own words, you know, because that, that might be, you know, we do that with pseudonyms. For instance, we ask folks to pick their pseudonyms and we don't always do that with quotes. And we might be going back to people anyway when we want to show them like what we're saying about them in the publication. So maybe it's a chance to do that there. Um, and then I think, Amy, if I remember correctly too, you also sort of made a decision of um, only the public facing accounts would be the ones that you were quoting from directly. And, um, and that's maybe another way to, to deal with it. It doesn't, it doesn't address the fact that maybe other people are referenced in those quotes, but if, you, if that's not so important and you just want the language itself, maybe maybe you make a decision to take a public facing account and to summarize a private one, although that's you know that's imperfect, right? But maybe there's something to be said for, for that. Yeah, I mean that was that was part of the, the way that I did it. And just I guess so all of the accounts that I followed were were public, but there were people that were kind of more influencer style and like very clearly trying to reach broad audiences and so when possible when I had examples from them that I thought worked I would prioritize those uh, within the the text itself yeah Fernanda yeah actually I would address the first question that didn't have any answer just for Sylvia not to be uh, without any answer I think uh, it's a great question about the external forces that uh, make us change what we have planned. And in ethnography, this is like very, very present. Um, I would say that it's always, research is always about contingence. And uh, we need to kind of accept that and work with this reality. Uh, and then adapt our methods based on what uh, what is happening. Uh, there are moments when you can't apply other alternatives, and then sometimes you may even drop some ideas because of that. But I would say uh, there is so much pressure on us as researchers about what we need to do and accomplish that contingency is something that we need kind of include in our in our uh, in our way of being, like instead of making it that kind of pressure, one more, uh, but that we we need to learn how to navigate through this, and this happens all the time. Like you are in the field work, you have plans to do a week in the house of someone, but the father of the person uh, got sick, so they need to go to another town, and then you need to say goodbye. And then you need to say, okay, this is what is going on, how I, I adapted this to other to other situations and to other um, methods and possibilities. And thank you for the question. Um, I wanna um, ask if Debadatta Chakraborty wants to ask their question about uh, research ethics and far right or other, other populations with whom you don't share politics. Hi. Thank you so much. Uh, so yeah, I mean, my, my question would be, you know, as I expressed, you know, um, you know, as, as a researcher, how do you make sure that, you know, you're being um, honest and, and, and just to your participants? Because, you know, uh, even though you do not agree with their politics, they have still agreed to be a part of your study and then they are helping you in that way. And then, you know, kind of also make sure that, you know, the in the way that you're expressing what they're saying, you can uh, show that these are, you know, thinking, feeling human beings 
who are making certain choices based on their situations. And then, you know, you're also asking them, you know, why they are making that choice. And then they are, they're sharing that with you. And, uh, you know, sometimes you're seeing them make those choices when you're in the field. So I'm doing ethnography and I'm also doing interviews with them. So, so you know, how do you, um, you know, how do you sort of deal with the ethics of that? And, you know, I'm currently doing data collection. I'm a PhD student. So I'm kind of dealing with that and, you know, kind of grappling with these questions. And uh, yeah, I, I just don't know, you know, if what I'm doing is the right way of going about it. So, so yeah, any, any thoughts that uh, you have would be very helpful. can jump in on this question. It is such a key question. I think we face online and in person. I think we are exposed in the online world, I think, to the to populations that clearly, clearly don't share our views in much more, I think, extreme ways than we may have previously. Um, but I feel like the same type of question would obtain regardless of the type of ethnography we were doing. So yeah, I would love to hear what some of you um, authors and editors think about that question. So I'll, I'll try with this. I will preface this by saying in full disclosure that I have not found myself in this situation. So I am I, I am do research on activists um, who I'm broadly speaking in agreement with. Um, but obviously I've you know been reading a lot about um, you know uh, right wing activists, extremists, um, and the way I think about it is sort of that you have to make peace with your own politics and ethics, right, you would, if it helps, I think it's thinking about doing it for you as opposed to your participants, right, that you have principles that you care with you in your research and what they mean to you. And they should, I think, be broadly consistent regardless of, of the topic and the types of participants that, that you're working with. So I think if you care about participants' privacy and if you care about not harming others with your research, then I think you care across the board, right? Regardless of what your participants do and think. And so I think I would conceptualize it more in terms of, you know, being consistent with your own ideas and your own, you know, ethical stances and politics and interrogating yourself really about what, what these are and then sort of trying to be consistent. As I said, I have not found myself in this situation practically. So I, you know, I'm not gonna pretend that this is, you know, uh, absolutely foolproof advice. But I think, you know, it, it it's think about who you are in this equation, right? And what you know, what this means to you. I I I think that would be my advice coming from this perspective. Yeah. Um, briefly, um, Debadeta, in my own experience researching communities whose views I don't agree with, though not, not far right groups, but other kinds of groups, my take has been to be as, as transparent as possible about where I'm coming from, as just, I think, a lead on to what, to what Betty just said. Um, because trying to hide it, I think that is where the ethics, I think, really comes into play. I think as long as the community you're working with understands where you're coming from and why you're working with, with those populations, like, Clearly, you're not there to just to denigrate them. I mean, that would not be again ethical research. You're there to try to understand something and try to translate that for your readers. Um, so that's I think it is a huge ethical conundrum. But I think the more you can be very, very straightforward about what it is you're doing and why, and working that out beforehand, so you're with the community and being as honest as possible. I think then you will feel you will likely gain more trust than if you try to hide what your own values or, or approach might be. Thank you so much. This is very, very helpful. Thank Great. you. Glad to hear it. Um, just sorry. sneak in that, you know, there's also the, 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 the dangers or the protections that you need to have for yourself in this too. And, um, and I think a lot about Kathleen Blee's work, who was writing about, you know, not neo-Nazis and women in the Ku Klux Klan and stuff like that. And, you know, she really experienced some of that kind of rubbed off on how she was sort of seen and treated within academia and, and perceived and the idea that she might be, you know, because she wanted to understand how these folks saw the world, um, that that might be her worldview, you know, as well at some level. And so there's, I think that 
that vulnerability that comes out of that as well. And, um, and also as, you know, another contemporary example, not doing exactly the same kind of work, but I think um, there's a, a doctoral student, Becca Lewis at Stanford, who has been doing some really interesting stuff online and is all, um, and has actually faced a lot of you know trolling and and um, and harassment um, from far right groups, and has also thought a lot about how to handle that and deal with that too. So so Becca Lewis may have some some ideas as well. Great, thank you so much. Yes, I've read Catherine Blee's work, but yes, I'll definitely look up uh, Becca Lewis and. And yes, I am very, very concerned about, you know, the, the pushback that not just comes from, you know, the communities themselves, but also from the academic community when, you're, when your work is out there. And, you know, and I, 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 I've had questions that people have asked me, like, so, you know, what do you do when, you know, these academics think that you are a part of the communities that you're studying? And I'm like, I don't know. <laughs> it's, it's something I'm figuring out. So thank you so much for bringing that in. And uh, Devadetta, Jessa just put a comment in the chat for you as well about it because she's not she's having some connectivity issues, but you can read her comments there. And I want to point out too that she also made a comment for Sylvia, uh, Sylvia's question. So just pointing you guys to the um, to the chat in case you haven't seen it. Um, I see a question from Deborah Nyangulu. I don't know if Deborah, you want to ask it directly. I'm not. A, I can read it, but I, I wonder if you want to give a little bit more details. Yeah, hi, welcome. Yeah, sure, sure, I can ask it. Yeah, so thank you. Let me just give a little bit of context to my question and thank you to the previous question. I think that partly answers it, but I myself am studying how nation states, communities are reproduced on, on Facebook. And I've done this from an insider perspective. And, but I've had questions about how can this study be replicated by someone who's studying it from an outsider perspective. And so my question being, okay, you have to study a digital community like a nation state, which is something that it's not a small community, it's more or less unbounded. Yeah, how long would it take for someone, so that it's an ethical piece of work for someone to, how long do they have to observe that community? Do they have to learn the languages, the local languages? And so, yes, I was wondering about how these traditional established practices of, ethno of ethnography apply then when you come to do a digital ethnography in terms of how long you have to observe a community, how long you have to know the other, how long you have to respect the other, to study the other. So that's, that's my question. important question for us to think through. I think I can respond to that. Um, first and foremost, though, I want to also state this, because this is something I stated in, in, a, in a, another workshop very recently, is part of having diversity in the academy is having people who are able to get access in spaces where others couldn't and can't. And so as much as we want to do work that can be replicated and do work that can be looked at from the vantage point of not just being the unique case. I think the unique case is also very um, valuable to what it is that we do. So I, I do, I, I just want to make sure that it's clear that like, you know, there is some value to being an insider. And I think particularly being a person of color, um, for me being an African-American male from, from an urban environment, um, I saw a lot of people doing work on my community that didn't look like me. So I do think that it is helpful to have um, a perspective from an insider point of view, because it's very rare often that, you know, we're able to have the expertise as well as the know-how to, to maneuver it as an insider. Um, so I want to make that clear. But um, to your point, I've moved from thinking about musicians to thinking about other types of creatives. And I've also moved from just covering primarily men to now interviewing young women. And I see there's a marked difference, right? In terms of how to get access, not just how to get access, but how to even get um, scheduling, <laughs> you know, or the level of like fearfulness, you know, understanding the male, male privilege and understanding that dynamic uh, and realizing, oh, wow, like this woman uh, is on OnlyFans and I'm just interested in her work, but she's thinking just you, oh wow, something fell. You being a male and, 
and you know I have never heard of a researcher I'm thinking you're a predator right and having to deal with those types of uh issues where like yeah I've had to like you know do a lot more work just to get half as far in this particular project as I have in the space where I was dealing with primarily um young black men who were like oh wow not just young black men but young black men from Chicago who likely heard or were introduced to me from a trusted source. And in some cases they could Google me and really just look through my history and knew who I was before I got in the room. And so I'm dealing now with a, with a, um, a population of, you know, like, and I'm just fascinated, right? And so I had to, I had to check myself. I had to talk to um, folks like Iria Halliday. I had to talk to folks like uh, Melissa Brown. I had to talk to, Mariah uh, Miller Young at uh, Santa Barbara, and like really be like, yo, like, am I am I doing this in a <laughs> am I doing this the wrong way, right? Because these were people who were writing work that I was, you know, sparked by, and um, I think if the if if the question and the why is is something that drives you, you know, you just realize that like the further along you get, you know, and, and I think about this as I study youth and I get older, um, it's gonna become harder to, to gain the same type of insider space, right? So, um, you know, I guess that's a long-winded way of saying, um, do the valuable work as an insider if you're an insider and don't necessarily be fearful of uh, if it's replicable because you might be getting data that's one of a kind and that in and of itself has a beauty to it uh and then on the flip side of that if you're an outsider just just know that you know everything is not gonna go like it did with the last project <laughs> oh because i think um for some the dissertation is like a, a starting point um to move in a puzzle direction but some of us we we deviate entirely like i did a job talk that had nothing to do with my dissertation and so like I've been going down these directions and, and sometimes hitting walls for the first time. And so uh, just, just understanding that, you know, both sides of the fence are valuable, but that, you know, they both have um, pitfalls. Cause I think as an insider, you also um, can be tone deaf to what's happening. <laughs> um, you might have all this data, but not know what to do with it because you're viewing it from an insider perspective. Yeah, again, really resonating with um, some of my own worries, thoughts, um, especially the getting older part and realizing you occupy different roles and that people really see you differently over time. Um, that's important to think about. Um, I want to now, and I mean, I don't want to close this off. It's such a great conversation, but remember, this is never really over. Uh, we're going to continue these conversations in our upcoming events. And uh, please feel free to reach out to any or all of us with questions. Um, once again, I want to really, really thank the um, authors of this special issue for your generosity, for being here, for your ideas. Um, of course, a huge thanks to Jeff and Jessa for steering this special issue. And of course, to Claudio and Andrew, who the editors of Qualitative Sociology, for um, having the idea in the first place for this and approaching us about it. That was, uh, it was really great um, to get, that, get the chance to, to put this together. Um, and of course, to all of you for being here, I mentioned also Holly Avella, our due coordinator, without whom these events simply would not come together. So thanks, Holly. Um, and yeah, thanks to everyone for being here. It's really a pleasure to see you. Um, join our mailing list, sign, come follow us on Twitter. And uh, when our next event comes up in October 21st, we're still a little bit TBD, but it's um, likely to be on climate change and digital ethnography, dealing how to deal with climate and environmental problems. So. We really look forward to seeing you there. We'll be posting all about it in our various venues. Thanks, everyone. Uh, thanks for having uh, taking the time with us. And we hope to see you at our next event. Enjoy your weekend. And thanks to you, Melissa. Thanks.